Oh, hi, I'm the heretic. On December 2018, after the Republican Party in the U.S. lost control of the House of Representatives but gained a couple of seats in the Senate, President Donald Trump realized it's now or never to get support for the border wall between U.S. and Mexico. You know, the border wall he campaigned on? His supporters exclaiming, Build the wall! The one he said Mexico would pay for? Besides the obvious fact that Mexico isn't paying for it, Trump needs Congress to approve and fund the construction. Congressional Democrats are staunchly opposed to it, so given how many seats that they have in Congress, there was a libertarian's chance at an Ivy League professorship that a Democrat House was ever going to pass it, come February. Negotiations with congressional Democrat leaders in a publicly televised discussion, well, put a bunch of overly opinionated boomers in one room, and you know what happens. You've you want to know something? You've said okay, it. Okay, you want to put that on my... you said it. I'll take it. Okay, okay, good. You know what I'll say? Yes. If we don't get what we want, one way or the other, whether it's through you, through a military, through anything you want to call, I will shut down the government. Okay, absolutely. As such, they tried to get Trump to blink on his threat to shut down the government. While it's awfully rude of the state to threaten us voluntarists with a good time, there's details about the government shutdown that most people aren't aware of. So I want to use this video to explain what a government shutdown actually means and what it means for you. Let's do this. So first off, what causes a government shutdown in the U.S.? The U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 states, No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. The Congressional Research Service points out that nothing in the Constitution prevents the government from making financial appropriations even if they don't have the money. Thus, agencies, particularly military agencies, would deliberately go over budget to coerce Congress into giving them free monies to avoid breaching contracts or otherwise causing a shutdown. As such, the Anti-Deficiency Act of 1884 was passed into law. Any government agency that spends more than what Congress says they can spend, as determined through the budgetary and appropriations process, reaches what is called a funding gap. Operations beyond that funding gap will be in violation of federal law and subject to fines and firings. Similarly, agencies are forbidden from accepting voluntary or personal services. Say, the people want to work at the agency for free or keep it open through crowdfunding. If it's in excess of their appropriations, it's illegal. Exceptions are made for spending during emergencies or non-discretionary budget items, for example, Social Security or Medicare. Generally, agencies that are required by law to remain open are exempt from the Anti-Deficiency Act. When a bureaucratic agency runs into its funding gap, it can cause a shutdown. So what causes funding gaps? Remember Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7? If not, then pay attention! Appropriations of government money are made through Congress, either through the budgetary process where the President of the United States submits a budget proposal to Congress who negotiate, vote on, reconcile, and submit a finalized budget to the President to sign or veto. Alternatively, the government can be funded through continuing resolutions, or CRs, which temporarily fund the government for a period determined in the CR itself, which only needs to go through the regular legislative process. The same is true with so-called omnibus spending bills. Naturally, Congress can also fund individual agencies through the normal legislative process. Failing to create a budget, continuing resolution, or omnibus spending proposal to pass, well, Federal bureaucracies whose funding comes from discretionary budgeting and whose function is considered non-essential will shut down. Of course, what non-essential means is determined by the government, and we'll get into more detail about that shortly. So what's a federal bureaucracy to do when they aren't any of those things and they can't keep the lights on because of a funding gap? Now, bureaucracies have attempted to remain open during funding gaps, expecting future payments from CRs, However, U.S. Attorney General Benjamin R. Civiletti put a stop to that in 1980 and 1981. So what other options do they have? 
will they stop operating until funding is restored? Though calling it a shutdown is a bit of a misnomer, implying it won't open again. But the term used is shutdown, so that's what we'll use. Now, the effect of a shutdown is that employees are furloughed. Yay, more vocabulary words. The important part you need to know is that employees aren't allowed to work at those agencies, as per the Anti Deficiency Act, being suspended from their job without pay. Furloughed, not fired, just to be clear. If their agency opens again, they can expect to keep their jobs. Now, nothing prevents Congress from legislating that bureaucrats receive back pay for the hours they would have otherwise worked, as was the case in the 2014 government shutdown and the 2018 shutdown, which is current at the time of this recording. But this is not a feature of shutdown procedure in U.S. law. But as you might imagine, without employees to keep the operations going, the bureaucracy is essentially non functional for the duration of their funding gap. Once funding is restored, assuming it is at all, and the funding gap isn't the result of an act of Congress to deliberately destroy that agency through starving it of money, well, everyone gets back to work. This is a simplified explanation of the mechanics of a shutdown. If you want to know more, I will include a link to the Congressional Research Service PDF explaining how shutdowns work in the description. So now that you know how shutdowns happen and how they work, Let's take a look at the current shutdown. Trump wants a physical wall on the Mexican American border. Such a wall would infringe on freedom of movement even more so than government borders already do. The U.S. government is also in the process of stealing people's land through eminent domain laws, in which the government authorized itself to take privately owned land as long as it's for public use. In this case, the border wall. The U.S. Department of Justice is already attempting to seize privately owned Texas land, either through negotiating a price or simple litigation and force. On the other side, you have Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, who refuses to give Trump the $5 billion he's asking for in building the wall, denying Trump the votes he needs to get his proposal passed through Congress. Schumer is obviously wanting to use open statist borders. To import statist welfare dependent voters. Whatever your personal opinion on this matter is, you will be forced to pay for it either way. No matter which way you slice it, neither side comes out good, but their impasse has led to the prevention of any continuing resolution that might have continued appropriations for government agencies from being passed into law. If Schumer attempted to pass a CR, Congress, still under control by Republicans until February when the Democrats take the House, wouldn't pass, and even if it did, it would never be signed into law by Trump. Conversely, the votes aren't there for Trump himself to get his preferred continuing resolution through Congress. As such, all non essential government personnel are on furlough until one side caves. But truth be told, the back and forth between Trump and Schumer isn't important. What is important is that the government shutdown is a powerful propaganda tool, one wielded against you and your liberty. Thomas Sowell explained this to one of his classes, and I'm paraphrasing here. Imagine you had a federal agency in the U.S. that did two things one, give medicine to sick children, and two, build statues of Joseph Stalin. Now imagine that same bureaucracy had its budget slashed, and as such, Had to cut one of those two programs. Which one do you think they would cut? Now, common sense would dictate that the statues would stop being built. After all, it makes no sense that a U.S. federal agency would build statues of a mass murdering dictator of a foreign country. So, if they had to cut one program, it makes sense that they'd cut that one, right? They'll cut the medicine to the children program. Arguments that the agency was crowding out. Private sector or charitable activity aside for now, just follow me on this one. The medicine program will be cut every single time. Not out of malevolence, mind you, but self interest. As it's in the bureaucracy's interest to get themselves as much money as possible, and it's the cut medicine program that will get their budget restored. If they cut the Stalin statues, people would do what you and I did and question why they were building them in the first place. 
Thus, their interest is to cut in such a way as to create as much controversy as possible, cause as much pain as they can to as much of the population as possible. This might seem extreme, but it's a common pattern in politics, extending even beyond U.S. government shutdowns. Calls for reducing government spending or even austerity are met with outraged responses about how heartless the proposer can be for wanting to cut spending to police, firefighters, or government schooling. Things like the military will be targeted because to many people, the idea that military personnel would fight in pointless wars without pay is unthinkable. A good example of this is in 2014, federal employees set up barriers, traffic cones, and armed guards around national parks and monuments, despite the government shutdown. And more recently, many federal employees are sharing their sob stories about how the government shutdown is hurting them. Day one of the shutdown, got my furlough papers, had brunch with fellow feds, obsessively checked news and bank accounts, contemplated a hashtag shutdown beard, drank at Jameson US with BT Stiller, ate mom's Christmas cookies, fell asleep to British Bake Off, hashtag shutdown stories. You have multiple bank accounts, had brunch with co-workers, and ate your mom's Christmas cookies. I'm sure the Rust Belt communities dealing with the stagnant economy and the opioid addiction crisis can so relate. Feeling so sad for you. No, not really. You destroyed Christmas for 800,000 employees. No one cares about you. If you are one of those employees, send letters to at least three congressmen and three senators demanding Trump be impeached. Hashtag shutdown. Hashtag shutdown stories. Congress has guaranteed that federal employees will get back pay. What you essentially have is a paid vacation. If anything, you should be demanding that Trump have a third term, dumbass. Well, if my husband, who works for the state, doesn't get paid, we won't have money to give our elderly cat his insulin shots, so we'd have to put him down. Hashtag shutdown stories. That's not a sob story. That's a hostage situation. Gibbs monies or else the kitty gets it. In addition, the Department of Agriculture has stated that if the government shutdown doesn't end by February, they'll run out of food stamps, an event that will almost certainly result in riots as people dependent on the state to simply feed their families will become desperate. All of this to maximize the public's perception of pain the shutdown is causing, so that the public will demand that the government agency's budgets be restored or even increased. Anything to absolve themselves of the anxiety they feel that people are suffering, in addition to having to put in the hard work of figuring out ways to solve these problems without the state even if they're ultimately being manipulated into supporting more government spending, which will eventually lead to either greater taxation or inflation, as well as reinforcing the insidious meme that society wouldn't function without the state. It's all a trick. Using your empathy to trick you into supporting ideas that will harm not only the people you want to help, but yourself in the long run. If you don't believe me, well... Remember what I said about essential versus non-essential government services? The essential services being the ones that remain open during a government shutdown? Well, let's take a look at only some of the services that the state determines to be essential and are still open. The espionage empire of the NSA, a term so coined by the Washington Post, will continue unimpeded. Dragnet surveillance of every conversation you have on your phone your geographical location, your text messages, your contacts, all will continue to be collected by the state with the NSA's $10.8 billion budget with facial recognition cameras and real-time surveillance that will ensure the government knows where you are and what you are doing at all times. That's not just for U.S. citizens as well. The NSA will continue to use its $500 billion espionage empire for programs like Echelon to spy on virtually any phone call, email, text message, what have you, around the world. Conducting surveillance on peaceful political groups like Amnesty International, Greenpeace, or others, while also shamelessly meddling in foreign elections around the world. Back to the domestic front, Americans will continue to be victimized by random searches of their property without even the pretense of law and order by getting a warrant signed by a judge. The Transportation Security Administration, or TSA, 
will continue to issue random pat-downs, strip search people with full body scanners, and do general security sweeps with x-ray machines and drug-sniffing dogs. All of it, little more than security theater, designed to give people the illusion of safety, even if all of these blatant invasions of our privacy and property rights don't actually work. The Pentagon will continue to give surplus military equipment to police precincts around the U.S., including automatic weaponry, body armor, assault rifles, and weaponized drones, while also running defense for the police's excessive use of force through the courts, dropping charges against flagrant violations of the law by police officers, ensuring that even the most psychotic cops can inflict their sadism on a helpless population and be assured of no consequences, especially given that police officers have a more lenient rules of engagement than the U.S. military did in freaking Afghanistan. Similarly, you can expect the incidents of cops shooting dogs and people being killed because a SWAT team tagged the wrong house will continue. There's a popular saying that the average American commits three felonies a day. It's a reference to the overwhelmingly massive U.S. legal code that is so Byzantine that nobody on earth could be expected to know every aspect of it, let alone follow it. During this government shutdown, you're damn right federal bureaucracies are working around the clock to increase the number of felonies you're committing today, all without even going through the legislative process, without any pretense of democracy, let alone your input. You know, if Trump took $5 billion out of the NSA's budget, he could easily pay for the wall. Hell, take that money out of the $10 billion he used to bribe Mexico and Central America, and you can pay for the wall and get Mexico to pay for it, indirectly. But they aren't going to do that. Both parties work in the interests of their own power. As such, their actions must necessarily further the interests of the state. As a propaganda tool... The government shutdown is insidious in its effectiveness and the way it conceals the blatantly criminal activity the state continues to engage in. Oh, the government's not spying on us because it's shut down. Even though that's not true at all. It's very simple. They're using the problem-reaction-solution formula where the government causes a problem and then presents itself, the government, as a solution. Problem. Children aren't going to get medicine because the government program that gives it to them is out of money. Reaction. Oh no! The absence of stolen taxpayer money being thrown at this problem creates the perception of the problem being made worse and prevents me from conceiving alternatives of solving the problem beyond government force. Solution. Give the government program that was only slashed of its spending power because of the government more money. Thus, People are not only spooked into accepting having more of their hard-earned money stolen from them by a coercive monopoly, but are tricked into thinking it's the only way to solve these problems. So with all this in mind, why wouldn't the state want to do this? Circling back to the current standoff between Trump and congressional Democrats, the threat they're wielding against each other is that people may perceive certain priests of sadism as the cause of their anxiety, and thus wouldn't vote to re-elect them in coming elections. Both are ultimately going to increase the size and power of the state, just in different ways. Either Trump is going to point guns at people to prevent them from entering the country, as well as seizing privately owned land along the border, or Democrats are going to accelerate their plans of implementing authoritarian socialism by importing more Democrat voters, pointing guns at the rest of us to pay for their welfare state. Either way, you're still going to be spied on. Pointless wars around the world will continue. The police will continue to be militarized. And any pretense of the so-called rule of law will continue to erode. Your liberties will be taken away. Your property confiscated without your consent. And because of how effective a propaganda tool the government shutdown is, ordinary, low-information people who are just trying to go about their lives will demand more of it. And you can bet... You are going to pay for every single dime that is spent on these programs during the shutdown. Don't fall for it. As exciting as a government shutdown sounds to those of us skeptical of government power, it never leaves us freer than before. Now how long will the government shutdown last? 
I can't possibly know, but we'll see in the coming days. One last thing before I go. Government shutdowns? Non-essential federal employees being furloughed? Well, that happens literally every week, around 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Friday until Monday morning next week. Yeah, that's right. The government shuts down every weekend, in addition to federal holidays. So if you watch this video all the way through, and you still think a government shutdown is the worst thing ever, well, it's happened before, will happen again, about 52 times a year, and we're going to be fine. Questions? Comments? Critique? What things do you do on a daily basis that aren't affected at all by the shutdown? Would you prefer a permanent government shutdown? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.